Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci with another uh, edition of Things We Said Today, our weekly show in which we talk about the Beatles uh, every which way but loose. Let me first introduce um, who's with us tonight from uh, the host of Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Good evening, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And from Beatle Fan and just returning from the Fest for Beatle Fans, actually, you both did, Al Sussman. Hey, Al. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And actually, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the Fest for Beatle fans. They went. I was not there. So I'm going to kind of grill the guys in, on, on what it was like and who and what they enjoyed and who the, the highlights were. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. And well, um, before that, though, Steve, uh, there was a little bit of news that, in fact, you broke this afternoon. That's... Oh, thank you. Well, actually, uh, it, 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 we got the word yesterday that um, things we said today will now be carried on pure pop radio. Yay! Can we have? Can we? Can yes. we have Yay! Yay. Yeah. Hey, yes. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be every Tuesday night at nine p.m. Eastern, which is nine p.m. Eastern uh, every Tuesday night. And so and that's in addition to the, the weekend airings on Fab4Radio.com, which will still be there. And actually, the Fab4 Radio uh, airings are, will be the initial airings of the show. Mm-hmm. And it's also on Podbean, and it's also on YouTube, and it's also on iTunes. So we're, we're all over the place, but uh, the addition of – of uh, pure pop radio is a is a big thing and we're all really happy and we want to thank alan haber for doing that uh, for allow it for Mm -hmm. adding us to his schedule and we're looking forward to a long run so thank you and we hope you will all turn tune in i i know i know ken is a uh is a fan of of, uh, pure pop radio Mm-hmm. That's right, and I think that anyone who's a Beatle fan would love this channel because they program music 24 hours a day that reminds you of uh, all the great things that make up Beatle music, and that meaning great melodies, great hooks, great arrangements, harmonies, all the hallmarks of what made up what the Beatles gave us through the years, and uh, I guess to some people they might want to call it power pop, mm-hmm. but... You know, it's music through the years from the 60s on up that fit that style. And if you're one of those people who still wants to hear something that interests them that they never heard before, as well as hear familiar songs, too, this is the perfect channel for you. There's so much music there that I've never heard in my life, and I'm discovering it now because the station is programmed so well. And it could be anything from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, last decade, and even new music. Because Alan Haber, who programs it, really keeps up on this stuff, and there's also great interviews on the channel as well. Right. So uh, I think that, uh, in fact, yes, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> this is a coincidence. Al Sussman, our own Al Sussman, did an incredible interview with Alan Haber that uh, just recently aired, just talking about uh, the history of pop music leading up to the Beatles. Right. And it was just, uh, it was really incredible. Yeah. A lot of stuff I hadn't heard. Yeah. And what's really, what's really cool about this is that it's not just a Beatles channel. You know, we we're on Fab Four Radio, and that's a Beatles channel. But this is not a Beatles channel, not right. exclusively mm-hmm. a Beatles channel, and that really is is very cool that that we're there. So, exactly. Thank you again, Alan Haper, and and keep uh, Tuesday nights at nine o'clock Eastern uh, on your calendar, folks, uh, so you can hear us. And then after that, listen to the channel with what it normally programs. Yes. Right. And there's there's quite there's quite a lot of Beatle music that you will hear, mm-hmm. and solo music, and a lot of Beatle covers too. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, I I listen I listen for that reason because I always look for that kind of material to add to my own show for every mm-hmm. little thing. So it's a great source for that as well as all the other music that gets programmed. All right, so now we're gonna let, let's let's get to the fest for Beatle fans, which was uh, just ended uh, Sunday night. Uh, it ran Friday through Sunday in uh, uh, Rybrook, New York. Right. And um, let me let, let me start with um, Al, because, Al, you were uh, I think you you were there all three days. Ken, you weren't there all three days, right? 
I was there Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday. Hey, Al, you were there all three days. Right. First of all, how how big was the crowd? Was it big crowds uh, all three days? Well, uh, Friday night was a disappointment because um, we had a uh, uh, <laughs> yet another uh, on the well, uh, literally on the first night of spring, we had a snowstorm. Uh, oh not a God. big one. But uh, enough, uh, we, I think, uh, especially up uh, in there in Westchester County, they got about seven inches of wet snow, which really kind of screwed the roads up because uh, a lot of it turned to ice. And uh, there were, you know, there were a number of bad accidents on the on the roads in the uh, in the area. So a lot of people that might have come, you know, spur of the moment you know, on Friday didn't because of the weather. So the, the, the crowd was definitely down on Friday night. But Saturday and, and Sunday as well, uh, the crowds, uh, Saturday particularly, there were a lot of people, you know, perhaps not as many as there were, uh, as there was on Saturday last, last year uh, for the big convention at the Grand Hyatt in New York. But a good, a very good crowd. And, and even Sunday, uh, which sometimes can be kind of down attendance wise. Uh, so we had a very healthy sized crowd on Sunday as well. Yeah. Um, darn that weather. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that, Chicago that, just got another bunch of snow within the last couple of days. So winter is uh, it's it's uh, going down, uh, going down kicking. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's, over yet. It's not over yet. Really? Or what, what happened Friday night? What, what kind of events did they have on Friday? Now, Friday is usually kind of like the meet everybody night. You right. know, there's the, in the, in the main ballroom, there's a meet the guest authors panel, which uh, Susan Ryan uh, moderates. And then a, uh, a panel of more authors and also photographers as well. And some of the other guests, and also then the uh, another panel with the the actual main guest, uh, the musical guests, <clears throat> and then a dance party, uh, a uh, you know a cost in effect a costume contest, and then Liverpool the the Beatle Fest house band does a does a concert, you know, kind of a, uh, a a shorter concert than they do on Saturday on Saturday night and Sunday. Uh, because afterward there was a, the premiere showing of a film on Liverpool, the, not the band, the city, uh, Mm -hmm. called get back the city that, that rocked Liverpool, the city that rocked the world that David Bedford, uh, the author of, uh, Liddy pool and, uh, Mm -hmm. the fab one Oh, uh, one Oh four, uh, introduced. So, wow. Did you get to see the film? Nope. Uh, I, I saw about 30 seconds of it uh, because I was kind of en route from mm-hmm. um, from the, the room where the panel discussions are uh, to somewhere else. I forget what I was on the way to, but, um, you know, I didn't yeah, I didn't get a chance to see uh, see the film. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to. That's, yeah, the, sure that's been a chronic sure. problem is that the uh, the at least for me is not a really a problem, but it's just that I'm busy with other things at the right. time when a lot of things go on in the ballroom. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I, I, there were so many things in L.A. that I wanted to do that I did exactly. not exactly. get, to, get to do because mm-hmm. I was so busy, you know, uh, walking around doing things. So, yeah, I, I understand. I, I know that feeling very well. Yeah, there's just so- there's so many things, even for somebody, even for a fan, there are so many things at the, at the fest to do. There's no way you're going to get to all of them. There's, exactly. It's just unless, unless you kind of split yourself in two. And even mm-hmm. then, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Know? Although we but, did have, between Bruce Beiser and Chuck Gunderson and myself, we had a uh, we had a nice little discussion late in the evening on uh, uh, in the discussion room on, on Friday night about the Beatle year of 1965 Mm, and yeah and that was that was a lot of fun 
who who showed up for the author? Who showed up for the? Uh, we the actually author had a, we had a fairly good turnout because I think people have kind of gotten you because we've kind of gotten into a tradition of doing these late night uh, discussions on Friday night. So we did get uh, we we probably got a better turnout than perhaps some of the other people earlier in the evening. You know, okay. and and plus I kind of know I was able to kind of quarterback because I know exactly what to sort of feed Bruce, you know, about Capitol Records and about the music and all and what to feed Chuck about the preparations for the 65 tour and about Shea Stadium and the mm -hmm. and the tour as it progressed. So uh, okay. so it was a lot of fun. Oh, good. And did you also did the meet the uh, musicians? Thank well, you. no, I wasn't. I wasn't involved with that because it was like no. right after, right from the meet the guest authors. Then okay. I had to. Fortunately, the uh, the two rooms are were very close, and okay. so I had to like run around to the <laughs> uh, the room where the um, where uh, Bob Abdow had just finished doing his puppet show and Tom Frangione, our colleague, our sometime colleague from here. And, and I, uh, did the, the first round of name that tune and, and Beatles trivia. Which other authors showed up on, uh, for the media authors? Besides uh, Skelterson let's and... see. Unfortunately, Robert Rodriguez, another friend of ours from, yeah. from here, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't able to attend because his, because Southwest airlines canceled his flight and they weren't able to put him on another one that would have gotten them here, uh, you know, in time to really get much done. So, oh, wow. so he had to pack in the the entire weekend. But uh, uh, Dave Schwenson, the author of uh, the Beatles in Cleveland the and the Beatles in Shea Stadium. Stadium, Judith Kirsten West, who has you know uh, has done several books including mm -hmm. a date with a beetle and the boys from liverpool and and some others d elias who did the uh, book confessions of a uh, of a beetle maniac jude sutherland kessler who has has done so far three volumes of her huge series of books on on the life of john lennon um, oh yeah, those those are those are amazing. Those yes, are, those they are really are. Stuff. Yeah, and maybe uh, maybe maybe soon maybe we can have her uh, have her on here. Um, I would love I would love to. I think she'd be it'd be great to get yeah. her on here. Yeah, uh, Chuck Gunderson, as I mentioned, who has of course speaking of monumental books, has yes. that huge <laughs> oh, two volume God. heavy oh, yeah. chronicle Ooh. of the three U.S. tours. Mm -hmm. He was a great guest on our show yes. when it was just Steve and me. Yes, he yes. So, uh, that was he was he was one of the I, that was when we went through the highlights. That was one of the better shows. He was mm -hmm. he was absolutely fantastic. Candy Leonard, Chuck, thank you. Ah, Candy, yes, yeah. Candy, uh, the author of Beetleness. Uh, in fact, we, on too. Sunday afternoon, we had a really nice Q and A uh, between the two of us, and much like you did with her in L.A., mm -hmm. uh, Steve. I love talking with her because yeah. that subject is so it just so there's just so much there and it's so it, it's so different and it really blows me it keeps blowing me away that nobody has ever really gotten into that like she did it's true you know very and you know I mean there have been books about the Beatles and about Beatlemania but nobody has ever really delved into it yeah the way she has and that's it, that's just amazing you know it really it's one of the best books. Uh, Beetle books that I have ever ever seen. It mm. really, really is. And to anybody listening, it's a fantastic book. It really mm. is. And in fact, well, what what and, makes it great? What, I'm sorry. What makes it great isn't that it's not just about the Beatles. Yes. It's just as much about the fans. Yes. And right. how they affected the world right. too. Exactly. Right. So. Right. And in fact, to put in right. yet another plug for Pure Pop Radio, Candy will be Alan Haber's guest this Thursday night. The twenty sixth. Uh, the twenty sixth on uh, which, which, yeah, which yes, by the time it will be before airs. this airs, but it'll be in the it'll be archived like my conversation was uh, on uh, in conversation with Alan. Oh, okay. And and as I said, Susan Ryan, uh, you know, anchored the uh, uh, the conversation. So it was uh, so mm -hmm. there were a lot of authors there. <laughs> cool, hmm. that's fantastic. All right, let's move on to Saturday, and you were both there on Saturday. Let me start with you, Ken. Mm -hmm. What what happened on Saturday? What did you do on Saturday? Well, 
most of the time I spent in the main ballroom because probably my favorite thing to do is to listen to the interviews that are being done and also to watch the performances. And it's it's all right there in that one room. <laughs> and, um, you know, any time that you have someone at the fest who hasn't been there ever or is only there a few times, they're really special to me. They're all special in their own way. And for me, since the music of the Beatles and the solo Beatles is what's always been the biggest reason why I love them so much, anyone that's ever been a part of it in a creative way with any of the Beatles, they are of paramount importance to me. So someone like Russ Teitelman, who has had a long career in the music business, and at least uh, as far as where we're concerned with his role in the Beatles is that he co-produced the George Harrison album from 1979. That was really special to me, um, as was Jack Oliver. There was an interview with Jack Oliver that I uh, got to see. He's working on, for those of you that don't know, he was the, the head of Apple Records for three years, from 1969 through 71. He was talking about the fact that he is working on a documentary on Apple right now. He's actually gotten Paul's approval. Mm. Wow. Uh, his own backing on it. So... Um, that's in the works and, uh, he's, I'm sure he's going to let us know as it gets closer to fruition when that's going to happen. That has nothing to do um, with, that has nothing to do with the Ron Howard thing, does it? No. Just, no? But they're mm-hmm. completely different things. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, I did not get to see him. This is one of the things, uh, you know, I wanted to bring this up before and I, I mentioned this about Mark Rapidos. Mm-hmm. Very often, the people who are working the shows are the ones that see the least. <laughs> they don't observe. Yeah, that's true. If you were, we should just have a fan as a guest to join us who actually got to observe a lot more. But um, Bob Eubanks, I really wanted to see the interview with him. I the did interviews see over that. the weekend. You did. Yes. What did you think? Al? Uh, I thought. Well, of course. I mean, the man is a total professional. You know, mm-hmm. and he knows how. Uh, now, Ken Dashow interviewed him. And in fact, had specifically requested because he uh, Ken is a huge fan of of Bob Eubanks, and um, he um, so he you know pretty much knew exactly what to ask him. But also, Bob Eubanks is a you know a total professional. After all, he was a DJ for however many years. He uh, you know obviously hosted the the, the newlywed game, which is probably mm-hmm. what right. best known for. And then, of course, all the stories that he has about the uh, the two Beatles concerts that he promoted at the Hollywood Bowl, plus the the concert at Dodger Stadium in 1966, right. and a lot of uh, his interaction with with the Beatles. So uh, it was really a fascinating interview. You know, mm-hmm. it, it really was. Mm-hmm. It was uh, you know uh, uh, nothing too revealing, other than a um, uh, he did mention apparently a. Um, not really an argument, but certainly a tete a tete he had with uh, with John Lennon uh, before the uh, the Dodger Stadium show, where as as Bob put it, they were they were nose to nose. <laughs> so really, yeah. yeah. Wow. Do you know what it was about? I don't remember what the issue was. In fact, I think Bob may not have been too specific about that. But um, but he said that apparently there there definitely was a uh, there was a discussion. He said there was a heated discussion between the two of them, you know, Mm. but the uh, but the interview. And also, I think he was he was glad not to have to talk about the the newlywed game too much. (laughs) You know, obviously they had to you know, they had to get into it somewhat. But to, you know, certainly to the non Beatle world, that's what he's known for. You know, he's really right. known for the newlywed game. And so he immediately has to talk about, you know, all the the goofy answers and even the more, you know, the X-rated answers and things like that. But uh, he also he, he does a very good impression of Chuck Barris. For oh, those, really? For, for those people who remember Chuck Barris. Chuck Barris, yeah. Oh, my sure. God. Oh, my God. The guy I, show. Did, I, did, I did ask him about the new – Edition of the New Leroy Game, and he hated it. He he was not he was yeah. not a big fan, which I'm not either. I think it's horrible. I mean, it's terrible. But yeah, I think Dashow uh, asked him about that too, and mm-hmm. uh, and it was yeah he, he was not not real complimentary about it. Mm-hmm. 
I would like to bring up one thing about Bob Eubanks because my wife got to see the interview. Mm-hmm. I think that was while I was doing one of one of my panels. Yes, you were, you were doing the, the the panel with uh, uh, Elephant's Memory, yeah, the guys from Elephant's Memory, exactly. Yeah, um, apparently he brought up Dave Hall several times. He did say, and this is for everybody who's not familiar with his work. You know, if you're not on the West Coast, you wouldn't have known who Dave Hall was. But Bob apparently said that he was very much like the Murray the K of of L.A. Mm-hmm. And um, he did have a lot of contact with the Beatles, and he did interview them on the set of Help, and we did an interview with him, Steve and I, right. and he had his new book out called Hullabaloo. But, you know, that's one of the, the big names in L.A. radio back in the 60s. Right. I mean, he was really huge, and, and here on the East Coast, I, I wouldn't have known who he was. But, uh, yeah, he did, he did uh, acknowledge Dave Hall in, in, uh, in his interview. Mm-hmm. And on the very same station, as I pointed out when we interviewed Dave, Casey Kasem was part of that lineup, too. And uh, they right. recently departed Gary Owens. Right. That's right, yeah. 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 That, whole, that whole L.A. scene, was a, uh, the, the radio scene down there was just absolutely fantastic. Sure. Well, mean, much, like it, it was, much like it was here, you know. Right, right. And I was, I was, I mean, I was fortunate enough to have a, a little bit of, a little taste of both of them. Sure. Um, I, mean, I, I was in New York, actually, a lot longer than I was around uh, the L.A. area, but I did hear both. And, but uh, the... Yeah, I mean, there was there was uh, all sorts of stuff going on in L.A. There was some great radio in L.A. Mm-hmm. If you were lucky enough to live there, and it, I mean, it, you know, there were there were various areas of the the country that had great radio stations. New York was one. New York had more than one. They had three big radio stations. Three up until uh, February of sixty, oh, April of sixty five, and then it was two. Was that when W uh, I uh, yeah uh, April of sixty five was when uh, wins uh, with all news which uh, the format that they've had now for a couple of weeks short of fifty years right okay and then there I mean there was uh, there was uh, San Francisco with KYA sure and, Chi- and, and Chicago Chicago with and, WLS yeah. and WCFL right and there was I mean you could there's any number of oh yeah any of the major the- markets had a, had a big at least one big top 40 station but as dave mm-hmm. as dave was telling us you know they were getting uh they were KRLA was getting exclusives and mm-hmm. you know and the uh, and the other stations were KHJ uh, uh boss radio was you know they were neck and neck they were nose to nose with those guys and mm-hmm. it was a great situation and and uh one of these days we're gonna have to talk about that because it was a lot of fun oh sure and kfwb right which has a which has kind of a new york connection because b mitchell reed who was one of the wmca good guys in fact uh did his last show 50 years ago last weekend and uh, so oh, that he wow. could, so that he could return to la to KFWB, from which he had come when he came to New York in the early '60s. Ken, you were. T- was there more you wanted to say about uh, Saturday? Oh yeah, um, the guests were fantastic. The other guests that were there for the weekend, Lawrence Juber, who's there quite frequently, but he's always amazing every oh, time you see him. Incredible. Right. Um, he is one of the greatest guitarists that's out there. Yes. Period. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is go to one of his concerts, and you'd be amazed at how well he plays. Oh yeah. And. Um, Apart from the fact that when he does his own show, he is incredible. I love seeing him on stage at the end of the of the night when he's mm-hmm. being joined by Liverpool because he plays electric guitar, which you don't get to see him do all that often because all of his concerts, he's on acoustic mm-hmm. guitar. But I also love to see, you know, this is someone that every time that he does a performance of his own, he mixes his own original songs and he has to do some Beatles and, and some McCartney because he knows he has that audience there. Mm-hmm. But he does more Beatles, and he enjoys it so much because mm-hmm. it's something that's a departure from what he normally does yes. and really lets loose on it. And you can see the smile on his face, how much he's enjoying this. Mm-hmm. He, he did Johnny Be Good live. Yes. And he's also, he, he did Chuck Berry's mm-hmm. Duck Walk, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as, as he's doing this. Plus the fact that Lawrence also sang. And I never heard him sing live, ever, until... Yeah. Uh, the mm-hmm. Saturday show, he sang Johnny Be Good, mm-hmm. and there was a performance by Jeff Slate's Birds of Paradox, yes, right. which for everyone who, everyone who doesn't know, Jeff Slate does a million different things. He's a great musician and a songwriter. He writes for Beatle Fan among, mm-hmm. amongst the many different publications he also, that he, he writes also, for. He's he also a, writes for Examiner, too. Yeah. 
Okay, yes, he does. Yeah, he probably writes for everybody. But um, he has been in music for quite a long time. He's been in a number of bands, one of which was called The Badge, which is very popular, out of New York. But in recent years, he formed a band called Birds of Paradox, named after the song, surprise, surprise, Sweet Birds of Paradox. And in the band, he has two of the members of Elephant's Memory, Gary Van Syok, who plays bass, and Adam Ippolito, who plays keyboards. Mm -hmm. And he's also got, when he can have them, Two of the members of the last lineup of Wings, Steve Holly on drums and Lawrence Juber on guitar. And he also has another great musician, Jimmy Mack, who yes. plays guitar. So, and Jimmy Mack has played with a ton of people oh, God, Denny yeah. Lane, uh, Gene Cornish, you know, a lot of people. Yeah. Anyway, so whenever they're doing a show locally here in New York, I try to see them. Mm -hmm. And they were amazing on stage because, first of all, you've got the musicians there. You try to mix in something that has a Wings connection or maybe Elephant's Memory. They did four songs from Back to the Egg. They did We're Open Tonight. Yeah. Where else are you ever going to yeah, hear right? We're Open Who Tonight? Who does that? <laughs> by, by anybody. Right. Um, and uh, they did Spin It On. They did Getting Closer. They did Arrow Through Me with Lauren singing lead. Yeah. Wow. And that's that is a bitch of a song to sing, yeah. and I got to well, tell you, because it's really hard to sing that with different intervals, musical intervals. Yeah. And um, actually, I should say five songs because they also did the rock extra theme. Yes. But Steve Holly sang lead on it. Don't come easy. The band did handle with care, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Mack did a great. The Roy Orbison party did that amazingly well, mm -hmm. and Jeff Slate did some of his original songs, and it was an incredible show. The band was so tight. You've got all these great musicians together, and you know the part of the thrill for me in seeing the fest. It's kind of like going to Ringo and the All Stars when you got different lineups all the time, and the the mere fact that you have a different combination every time you see them, like when you go to the fest, makes it even more special. Because at the end of every evening, there's always this big jam session mm -hmm. with the house band Liverpool. They do their own set, and then they they have all the guest musicians come up on stage right. and you have a different combination every single year mm -hmm. and um you've had mark hudson for something like the past 10 years or it's more and he's been yeah he's been a mainstay and he's great mm -hmm. and you know the fact that he has that that association with ringo especially though he worked with with um paul and george too mm -hmm. on ringo stuff but uh you've got him you got mark rivera who is <laughs> The more that I see him, oh. the more I'm so blown away by this man because, you know, you're so used to thinking of him as a sax player, mm -hmm. especially when you see him in Billy Joel's band or Ringo's. Sure. With the, But with Ringo, he does so much more. He does a lot more percussion stuff. And in the, the more recent tours with this with this current lineup, he's been singing lead a lot mm -hmm. on the Toto stuff. Yep. And he's a fantastic singer. And the album that he put out last year, Common Bond, proves that. It's, it's an amazing album. Yeah. Yeah. And so... This is someone that is only too proud to talk about working with Ringo and his love for the Beatles. And here he also gets a chance, just like with Lawrence Juber, to do Beatles stuff that he normally wouldn't do if he's in Billy Joel's band, although Billy once in a while does Beatles. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that he does with Ringo, it could be other material that Ringo does. And he got to sing, got to get you into my life. And he sounded fantastic on that. And then he did the song Money, 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 which is on Common Bond, which is the song that Ringo's on by the way, and mm -hmm. the band sounded fantastic. Yeah. And that's another thing that I wanted to bring up about Liverpool. And I never get to say this that much, mm -hmm. but, you know, in recent years, I've really gotten to listen to a lot of the Beatle cover bands. And going to the fest every single year, Liverpool impresses me more and more, not just because of the fact that they play so well, but when you're able to back up all these guest musicians on their material, that impresses me even more. Mm -hmm. And they are just the band playing on Money, Money, Money. I mean, they were just a real tight unit oh, of yeah. great musicians. Well, I think specifically um, that in in the case of Liverpool, that the the addition in the last few years of Glenn Burtnick, uh, who was a you know kind of a Jersey rock legend, plus his years with Sticks and all, uh, right? And John uh, Merjavi, I think the addition of those two really tightened that group up a great deal uh -huh. and really ramped up their their performance. Not only that, but a few years ago when I was watching Liverpool, they did Within You, Without You. Mm -hmm. And John Merjavi played the sitar. I mean, how many yeah. Beatle bands out there do you have a guy <laughs> who plays the real thing? 
not not in a synthesizer. Yeah. It's the real instrument. Yeah. So he had mm-hmm. to learn that. Sure. I mean, they're so into this, and you know, they are definitely one of the best Beale cover bands out Absolutely. there. I wish that they kind of tour because I think the only time they ever do anything, although they did tour with the Beach Boys yeah. like last year, two years ago, mm-hmm. but most of the time they only play at the fest. So, but they're really one of the best that's out there, and this is a great combination. But whenever they back up any of these musicians, I remember a few years ago when Ronnie Spector was a guest, yes, and they were doing Try Some Buy Some. Mm-hmm. Which is another really difficult song mm-hmm. to pull off. Yeah. There's a lot of time changes in there, and it's it's very difficult to do that song. Mm-hmm. And this band does it so well. Doesn't matter whether it's Ronnie Spector or Peter and Gordon or when Billy Preston was alive or you know any of those people, they pull it off mm-hmm. and they do it very well. Yeah. So um, you know, kudos to that band. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I so think if I remember correctly, you had to go directly from seeing. Birds of Paradox with Gary and Adam right over to the uh, discussion uh, room for a panel discussion with them and you with you and our friend Aaron DeVivo. Yeah, and that was great because it was basically talking about that whole period with John and Yoko. And uh, I've known Gary for quite a number of years. We go back to my days in New Jersey radio back in the 80s when I interviewed him. And, um, you know, they just it's it's amazing to think that that particular period, they did so much (laughs) with John and Yoko. When you think about the Sometime in New York City album, then there's the Elephant's Memory album. Then there's Yoko's Approximately Infinite Universe. Then there's the one to one concert. Then you've got all the TV appearances, Mike Douglas, Dick Cavett, those. That was a lot in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. So they have a fascinating story to tell. But basically, you know, they're very proud of that time with John and Yoko. And, you know, I like to just bounce around and talk about the differences between sometime in New York City recording that album, recording Elephant's Memory, uh, that album and Yoko's album and what it was like. What were the differences between working with John and Yoko? So um, that's always an interesting conversation right there. Mm hmm. And talking about John, they they certainly remembered not only in the very beginning rehearsing a lot of, you know, 50s rock and roll and all that. But uh, when they did Sometime in New York City, it was recorded very quickly. And John wanted to get a song done each night and uh, may not be the Please Please Me album recording 10 songs in one day. Mm -hmm. But to do one one song a day, you know, that's pretty fast. (laughs) Yeah. And then working with Yoko, they really enjoyed it. For the most part, and uh, there wasn't it wasn't like the like um, they gave the band instructions mm-hmm. on on what to do. They it kind of like fell together very quickly. You kind of knew what to play. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, so I love talking to the two of them, and I got to interview Adam privately, which I had never done before. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, that was that was a great time, and Darren was a great. Uh, you know, co-moderator with me. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed doing. Uh, I did another panel on Sunday, and Darren was involved with that too. And that was with Nancy Lee Andrews. Right. But um, that's the thing. There's there's nobody more important to me personally, and you guys could disagree than the people that worked with the Beatles, whether it was creatively or maybe they had a personal relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And when you've got the two surviving members of that band of Elephant's Memory, you know, that's something to treasure right there. Sure. Who else can talk about that period? Same thing with any of these people, Mark Hudson, Mark Rivera, Lawrence Juber. You know, those are people that are really special to me. And if any of them could just talk about what it was like working with them creatively in the studio, on albums, whatever, that stuff is priceless. Sure. Because that's what we should, you know, best admire the Beatles for mm-hmm. all these years, the whole creative process. Not to discount the authors, I love the authors, Mm -hmm. but the people who are closest to them, those are people we should be treasuring. Sure. You know, and and uh, that's 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 the real value of of of, uh, events like this, where you get to, you know, you get up close with these people. I mean, you'd never, you know, I mean, you'd never get any other opportunity like that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what's really, you know, being able to talk to Mark Hudson. You know, who worked so much with Ringo, with uh, Mark Rivera, who has, you know, who's been, who still actually is a member of the All Star Band, even though he's ha- hasn't been with them as much recently. I mean, he, but yeah, I mean that that, that whole All Star Band thing just fascinates me. The way that continues to work. I'm just saying that, you know, for people who are ready to dismiss Ringo, Ringo keeps keeps doing it. I mean, Ringo does what he, you know, he knows. 
what he does and he's he, he doesn't try to go crazy and you know and and working with him you have people like Hudson and, and Rivera who have who have done that um you know and then you have all you know you have you know you have other you know you well have of course to be to be totally accurate uh Mark Hudson has not worked with Ringo for the last I guess what four albums because right. the, the relationship I, with them ended after right. uh uh, I guess about 2006 or so. But it, but well, I mean, Liverpool, part, Liverpool eight. Well, okay, right. Liverpool eight was the last he time. Of, yeah. He was part of the history of. Oh sure! Oh absolutely! And yeah. I think all of that, you know, all of that comes into play. You know, all of that, and that's one of the benefits of, you know, you talk to people like Jack Oliver who were, who were there on the scene. You know, uh, um, Russ Tittleman who you know who did work with George on the on the on that album and. You know, so you you get that's one of the real benefits of attending these things is you get to deal with these, you know, you get to talk with these people and actually meet them. You know, we actually personally, you as a fan get to talk to them, and that's really something that is really you know one of the, one of the real benefits of this whole thing. Of, anyway, let's get back. Matter of fact, we but, we've forgotten Gary Wright. That's oh, right. Yeah. I was going to say that. That's right, Gary Wright. Gary Wright was also there. Was he there Saturday too? He was there Saturday, he, and I think I think he was there Sunday as well. I saw Gary perform mm-hmm. doing the three songs. Yeah. He did Dreamweaver, Love is Alive, and To Discover Yourself, mm-hmm. which was uh, you know a real treat to hear that song with the band backing him up, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially considering the fact that you know he wrote that with George. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, and he has a brand new book out about his life with George, who was such a, a big influence on him, probably more so than anybody. Right. And uh, But there's one other thing that I, I just want to bring mm-hmm. up about these musicians, and it isn't just the fact that they worked with a Beatle. If their lives have been music, and then they, they've been performing music and writing music, they have a deeper understanding of what the Beatles have done. And they could bring that to the table. And one of my favorite things that I like to watch at the fest is when they have a panel there of musicians and they talk about influences yes. or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they bring up things just off the top of their heads that most of us wouldn't think about. And not only that, but you have somebody like Lawrence Juber there who was brought up in England mm-hmm. most of his life. He has a different perspective of things, yes. you know, and he can, he can relate more about the early roots of rock and roll and what was played on the radio in England as opposed to what we heard here. And so that part, you combine all that together and it's, it's really fascinating. In fact, you know, they, uh, they, they, in this particular under the influence uh, session, they were talking a great deal about the, the whole uh, blurred lines um, got to give it up controversy and about you right. know, what's, uh, you know, whether a, uh, you know, a, you know, can a riff be copyrighted or, you know, can a, uh, you know, just, a, you know, the, the atmosphere of a record, could that be copyrighted? Because that's a, that's a whole show right there. I mean, yeah. cause there's a, I mean, obviously for everybody, anybody that knows the George Harrison court decision several years ago relates very much to this whole blurred line. Uh, well, not only that, but also the uh, the the situation with um, uh, the Tom Petty song and the um, Sam Smith. Sam Smith, thank you. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Uh, his his hit, uh, which uh, has more than a passing resemblance. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But it's I, I really enjoy that discussion yes. because they all were in agreement. Yes. And these are all musicians, so you gotta you gotta take what they say a bit more seriously than the rest Absolutely. of us. Because um, Stevie Wonder even said the same thing mm-hmm. just after that court decision was made. You can't copyright a groove exactly. or a, or a feel. It's one thing when you when you're talking about stealing a melody. Mm-hmm. You know that's another thing altogether. And th- what they were able to do so well was to play certain chords. Yes. And uh, and and display to everybody with the same combination of chords how many songs have been created with the same uh, chord progressions Mm -hmm. over and over again in fact there was one thing and it reminded me of when i interviewed lawrence juber a year or two ago he was bringing up the fact that i never heard it in my head but you won't see me came out in 1965 and and there was a lot of great motown stuff coming out that Mm -hmm. year and he said to me that that's not too far removed from it's the same old song yeah 
And then sure. he played the chords to both. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, I yeah. never heard that. And that's, that's, yeah, yeah, exa- very much so. Very much Let me- so. When you have musicians doing this and they bring this stuff to light, you know, and you, you know, it's, that's indispensable mm-hmm. hearing that from people who study this stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Let me bring up a couple of other guests um, that we haven't mentioned so far. Did you guys see uh, Alan Tannenbaum, Bob Gruen, and Rob Shanahan? No. Uh, the, uh, Bob uh, Bob was there. Bob Gruen was there on Friday night, but mm-hmm. I did not see his uh, his session. And uh, the Photographers Forum, which uh, which both Alan and uh, Rob participated in, along with Nancy Lee Andrews, I didn't see that. Although Ken, weren't you and weren't either you or Darren involved with that? Yes, Darren and I did that right. one, and that was a lot of fun mm-hmm. because Nancy Lee Andrews is someone that, you know, she's in recent years, she's made herself known because of her, her photo book, Absolutely. A Dose of Rock and Roll, which mm-hmm. came out a few years ago. Sure. And uh, she's got some story to tell there because, you know, apart from being Ringo's girlfriend mm-hmm. for the for the good part of half of the decade, she was engaged to him. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, that says something right there. She told me it was 1976 when Ringo proposed. So there was several years there when they were engaged to each other. Right. And she got to see a lot of what was going on uh, at that time with, with Ringo's album. She was involved with the photography for the front cover of Ringo the Fourth, mm-hmm. and also the front cover of the Bad Boy album. And, um, you know, she was there at a time when I think a lot of fans would be interested to know what Ringo was like because it started the, you know, the the downturn uh, of, right. of his career. And how did Ringo handle that? And well, he wasn't used to that, especially after coming coming off of Ringo and Goodnight Vienna doing so well. Plus, also, that was also uh, that was still during a period when he had a lot of interaction studio wise and personally with. Uh, at least with George and uh, and John, and to some extent with Paul. She had some great photos in uh, oh, sure. L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other guest I wanted to ask you about was, did you guys get to see the Weeklings? Oh, yes. And they were fantastic. <laughs> you know, actually, um, they were on Sunday, and they started while I was at the end of the Nancy Lee Andrews panel. Yes. So as soon as that was done, I ran right. back in to catch the Weeklings. And... They just sounded amazing. They sound just like the record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think the crowd really dug them a lot mm-hmm. because they mixed the Beatles stuff with their originals. And not only was the musicianship and the playing so good, but their harmonies were just spot on. Yeah. And um, they just sounded fantastic. I know that at the end of the show, when they were uh, meeting and greeting fans and selling their stuff, there was a big crowd around mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. So uh, they really dug that performance. Yeah. Yeah, they and uh, it's uh, you know the album has gotten now. Steve did a very very favorable review of the mm-hmm. album and uh, and actually it's gotten very good notices. Yeah, I've been carrying that in my uh, iPhone and listening to it. It's, yeah, it's really it's really good. Uh, it's you know there are so many Beatle tribute albums out there. I mean, I had God knows how many there are, but I, this one actually brings you back in. It's it's yeah. one. That you will find yourself listening to over very and over much. Again. So I, I bumped into I bumped into Glenn in the uh, in the flea market, and mm-hmm. uh, he was telling me that they had that it had gotten you know a lot of you know very very positive word of mouth, especially on social media. Mm-hmm. How about you mentioned the flea market? How is the flea market? It's um, it's not what it used to be because there are let's face it, there are a lot of dealers who uh who no longer go to the fest only because you know they they feel that they can make more money selling online mm-hmm. so the it, right. it's not the wall to wall dealer paradise that it was even 20 years ago and there's a and now the 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 there's a separate fest store because it had been, you know, the the um, licensed merchandise that the fest sells, uh, the area for them had been growing and growing and growing uh, over the years, and so the last year was decided to have like a separate store, 
uh, apart yeah, from what they call the marketplace. But, right, and I, you know, and and mm-hmm. when I remember saying after the LA Fest, I wish they would go back to the, and I think a lot of the dealers wish that too, because there was a lot more traffic with with the two stores together, and I hope they at some point decide to do that. I well, I, it would have been uh, actually if the if the convention had been at the hotel in Secaucus, it would have been forced to be together. But the problem mm. is that there's that the 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 fest now carries so much merchandise mm. that it's it's it really is better for there to be two separate rooms, and mm. and especially in this case because they were side by side, which has not mm. always been the case, and it wasn't the case in Chicago, and it wasn't in L. It wasn't, in LA. wasn't in the case in L. A. But the, in this case, they were side by side, so. Uh, so that that seemed to work very well, but uh, but the, yeah, there were uh, and of course the usual the kind of the usual suspects <laughs> you might say were in the oh, flea yes. market. The you know the usual Rockaway Records and uh, Bruce Spicer, of course, was there, and uh, you know a number of uh, you know the the memorabilia dealers who have been there almost since the first year in '74. Okay. So, so there was still a, you know, there was still a good size flea market. Okay, let me ask. Well, you, I got to tell ask. you, I did notice because I didn't spend any time in the flea market. Mm-hmm. I passed by it, yeah. but it wasn't even half the size of what it was in New Jersey. No, and uh, and same thing with the main ballroom. The main ballroom is much smaller than what you had in New Jersey. Right, but the the trade off was that there were all these other little rooms because, especially since. Michelle and Jessica Lapidus, particularly, uh, and Danny Abriano, they have been, you know, trying to kind of expand the focus of the fest into other areas. And so mm-hmm. there was this room called the Fabratory, where there would be discussions and presentations and things. And that seemed to get a lot of very good reaction. Uh, and and some other some other things as well. So so yeah, the ballroom wasn't as big, but it also didn't get as ridiculously crowded as the one in in Secaucus would on a especially on a Saturday night where you know people mm. would be you know just like crowded in like sardines. It wasn't as big, but it was probably wider than than the one in Secaucus and the flea market. Um, I would say, I mean, total space, no. Uh, but if you probably, if you separated, if you, you know, put a, a, a separation line down the middle of the room and put the fest store at, on one side and the other dealers on the other side, it's probably about the same. You know, plus the fact that certainly for the dealers, it wouldn't be, uh, you know, 120 degrees in the room because that's right. always been a, a big problem in Secaucus mm. has been the fact that it would be either. And, and I know this firsthand, having sat at a Beetle fan table for several years in the, in the 90s, and it would either be too, too hot or too cold. And there generally was never any, uh, any in between. And so I, uh, I, I, I have a feeling a lot of the dealers did not miss being in Secaucus at all. Mm-hmm. And let me also okay. ask: Were there any uh, "quote unquote" imports uh, in, in the uh, dealer oh, room? The, uh, <laughs> I didn't see any, but these days, you know, they're really um, it, it, because of the fact that everything is kind of available online, including, you know, this recent, uh, you know, BBC BBC, uh, Mm -hmm. distribution for free of, you know, 20, what is it, 23 discs worth? 24. 24. 24 discs of material. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right now, there really isn't, you know, there really isn't kind of a a need for those particular types of um, uh, imports. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh uh and there there was definitely no uh separate um room for imports let's put it that way hmm. okay okay can i ask al a question please go ahead i just wanted to know how your panel went with candy and if there was any material that you covered there that it was wasn't put up on our show i was telling steve before we began uh, recording it was wonderful it yeah it, it flew by 
uh, you know, I, uh, I, I kind of knew the kind of questions that I wanted to ask. Now, I didn't see Steve's session with her in October in, in L.A., uh, which may mm-hmm. have been a good thing because that way I, wouldn't, I wasn't influenced. So I had like a, you know, kind of a specific uh, series of questions and uh, it, it went very well. Candy, of course, you know, she's a very good public speaker and she gave, you know, very full and very complete answers you know, there were no mm-hmm. yes or no answers, and especially considering that um, we've talked before in other in other forums, you know, in actual panel discussions and things like that, uh, we're familiar. You know, we're familiar with each other, and I'm fam- obviously very familiar with the book and and one of the subjects in the book, mm-hmm. and so it went very well. The only problem was it went too quickly. It was forty five minutes. And I suddenly looked at my watch because I was all set to kind of let the crowd ask questions. And I looked at my watch and uh, at the same time that uh, I saw that there were about two minutes left, the uh, the sound guy was giving giving us, you know, wrap up uh, signals. So oh, that was the only negative, it was, but it went very well. It was a very, uh, very nice conversation. And and also somebody took some nice photos that uh, that have uh, appeared on uh, on Facebook of the two of us, uh, uh, right. you know, from the conversation uh, that appeared I, yet, uh, within the last day or so. Yeah, I saw right. those. I saw those. They were, yeah, yeah. She's a great. She's a great speaker. And yes, I, she I is. Look, forward, look, look forward to having her on the show uh, on our show again. Mm-hmm. Um, anything? Anything else? Let's talk. For uh, there's been some social media since uh, uh, the fest ended about the fest itself and with some critical comments. Let's talk about that. And because you and I were discussing this before we got started out Mm -hmm. and and some of the, some of these criticisms have been going on for years. People are going, why don't we have such and such, you know, why doesn't so-and-so come? Why don't Paul and Ringo come, you know, uh, and let's, uh, let's talk about the reality of that situation. Um, First of all, the the why the such and such. Um, there are probably people we would all love to see there, and the fact is that well, number the one, fa- the fact is the re- I mean, the real reality is that mm-hmm. the the guest pool has been shrinking because you know um, you know I'm sorry, but Harry Nilsson is dead, and uh, Victor Spinetti is dead, and Walter Shenson is dead, and uh, Doris Troy is dead. And Billy Preston is dead, and so are a number of other. Mal Evans, who was uh, mm-hmm. guest at the uh, uh, the second Beatle Fest, is dead. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a number uh, of guests who have been at the fest over the years who are gone. It's uh, you know, I, I mean, to not to, to interrupt for a second. Mm-hmm. Having heard the stories about Harry Nilsson, I you know uh, Harry uh, Harry has a Harry is, lives on in Beetle Fest. Oh, uh, Harry is one of the for a lot of reasons is one of the greatest guests in the history of the convention uh, for a lot of different <laughs> reasons. Right, but um, right. but the uh, you know uh, George Martin is 89 years old, virtually deaf, right. uh, and doesn't travel, and has never done a convention. Uh, the, right. Cynthia Lennon is a widow now. She's been in somewhat poor health over the last year or so. She doesn't want to travel and has rarely done conventions. Uh, the, the, the Beatle offspring, you know, the children of the, of the individual Beatles, none of them have done a convention, and I doubt none of, if any of them ever will. You know, Paul and Ringo, I think that's, you know, that, you know, that, that answers itself because, you know, I, yes, I know there was a, uh, there was a monkeys convention in um, Secaucus, New Jersey last March at which the three surviving monkeys appeared. Well, guess what? The monkeys, yes, they were created in the image and likeness of the Beatles. The monkeys are not the Beatles. And Paul and Ringo, I mean, if they, if they, you know, they have an open invitation. You mm-hmm. know, John Lennon nearly came to the first Beatle Fest, and then, mm-hmm. you know, to to do the drawing for the uh, the charity raffle and chickened out. Uh, but 
over the years, they all have known that they have an open invitation and none of them have chosen to accept it. So I think, you know, that's that's a, a, a point that you, we need to take a little further, because mm-hmm. really the Beatles, it's not I mean, it's not just the fact that Paul and Ringo won't do it. Paul and Ringo are in that class of celebrity that really goes beyond. Yeah, you know, I mean. Well, we're they're, talking, we're, they are the only literally they are the only two people alive who know that kind of fame because Bing Crosby is dead. Frank Sinatra is dead. Elvis Presley is dead. John Lennon is dead. George Harrison is dead. Ringo and Paul are the only two people alive who know the kind of fame that those, you know, the 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 summit of pop music success, mm-hmm. uh, but but even 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 more so though, they're they are currently, and even if even if you know the Beatles don't, you know in, in well, terms yeah. of social, I mean, they, social they, media, they are still very very big. Yeah, they Paul, have ongoing look, careers. Look yeah, at Paul McCartney. Absolutely. Paul McCartney is one of the biggest celebrities, one of the richest men in the world. Sure. And to to even expect that Paul McCartney would do that is really out of the, is out of the question and it seems uh, almost two-thirds of the time uh very close to the time of a fest either of them or both are on tour so mm-hmm. obviously they you know they're not gonna take time out to to appear at a you know at a, at a fest so you know that's just out of the question but so the people that complain about the guests you know i just that's just it's it's ridiculous they also mm-hmm. complain about the cost well guess what uh, they, if you compare the price of a ticket to see Paul McCartney, and and a ticket to 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 spend three days at the fest, they're about comparable. In fact, actually, a ticket for um, you know for you know a really good seat for a McCartney show is going to cost more than it is to go to the fest for the entire weekend, and right. uh, and much much more if you take one of the VIP packages. Mm-hmm. So right there, you know, that that cancels out that argument. The price, you know, it's you know, it's just the going these days. It's the going rate. You know, people are going to say, oh, well, the tickets were only, uh, you know, I don't know, eight dollars in 1974. Great. How much was a quart of milk in 1974? Right. You right. Know, how much was a car in 1974? You know, people again. People who do that kind of complaining are just, you know, they, they're either they're either too ignorant to realize how ignorant they sound, or they're just these these, as I call them, the never satisfieds, who just, you know, they're just never satisfied by anything. They have to complain about something, and they have, to, especially if they spend a lot of time on social media, which some people spend far too much time uh, doing. You know they uh, they have to complain, and uh, that's uh, a- and then also there are people. There seems to be a crowd that is very attached to the fact that for many years the ho- the the convention was in the hotel in Secaucus, which mm-hmm. you know thirty five years ago was a very nice hotel. It was a nice. It was a new, very nice hotel. Well, it's not a very nice hotel anymore. It's pretty much a dump. And the the accident that happened in, with the snowplow and the parking garage and the damage that was done to the exhibition area, I think was a blessing. And I think the majority of people, especially the, the people that were there for most of the weekend, I think the majority of people actually prefer the hotel in Rye and uh, mm-hmm. do not at least don't want to go back to Secaucus. But there are, for some, for whatever reason, whether it's you know sentiment, I, I keep I keep hearing people making the Shea Stadium comparison. You know, it was you know it was a dump, but it was our dump. Well, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's that's silly. You know that. Uh, well, I mean, thank God that accident didn't happen during the fest. Oh my God! Right. Oh my God! That would have been that would have been catastrophic. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, are you kidding? That would have oh, there would have been there would have been deaths. Right. Are yeah, you I mean, kidding? just think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but uh, I mean, it's it's good that it happened when it happened, and they were and able. And it was to- an absolute miracle. 
Uh, fortunately, uh, right after the accident happened, I think mm-hmm. the hotel in uh, in Rye, uh, the I keep calling it the hotel. It's called the Hilton Westchester. They, I think, they kind of sense that maybe maybe there might, might be a chance to get the fest up there. So they immediately contacted Mark with the Tom, Mark and Carol were in Florida at the time, and mm-hmm. you know they they really put on a sales pitch. And in fact, on Friday afternoon, uh, they had a they had a press event, you know, a media event uh, mm. there for uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, you know, for uh, Rybrook, and I think also Westchester County. Uh, and it became uh, including having Liverpool play a couple of songs, and it became a like a local media event. Uh, they mm. so they really did a great job in kind of drafting the the show, but also the just the the mere fact that we're you know that it was it was able to be moved you know this whole operation was able to be moved from Secaucus right. to Westchester County was a near miracle. Actually, Ken, uh, let me let me ask you um, since I just ran went into this rant, <laughs> you knew this was going to happen, didn't you? <laughs> Yes. How do you really feel? Yeah. Al? How do I really feel? Let me throw the the same uh, subject matter at you, and since obviously, uh, you know, you know, not only are you involved with, uh, you know, the convention itself, but also you're a fan, and you've you've attended the fest for many many years, both in an uh, unofficial and official con- uh capacity how do you feel about all of that you know about those the various complaints and things like that well i try to take a look at everything and look at it in full at every every angle and as much as i don't want to have to admit this there are a lot of people as they get older they don't like change yes. at all mm-hmm. and i know people that live where i live in connecticut where if they have to leave their town <laughs> It's a struggle. You know, they want to keep everything right where it is. Mm -hmm. So I understand how some people are that way. And it's really not that far from Secaucus. A lot of people think that we're talking about Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And it's not that. Mm -hmm. It's it's maybe, I don't know, half an hour away from Secaucus. Mm -hmm. It's not that much more of a drive. Mm -hmm. And I actually like this hotel much better yes. than the one in, in Secaucus. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's more spacious, much more modern. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the fact that there are more rooms to do more activities. Mm-hmm. And you also have to question that as time goes on, you have to make adjustments to the fest. Mm-hmm. Now, I am a first, or I guess some people call it a second generation person, mm-hmm. where I care more about the guests than anything else. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of younger people who care more about the Battle of the Bands than they care about the guests. Very true. Who don't even know who Gary Wright is. Right. Who don't even know who Lawrence Juber is. Mm-hmm. You've got those fans, too. You've got to try to appeal to everybody. And in many ways, I look at any kind of event or program, it's all the same. I do a radio show every single week on the Beatles. Mm-hmm. I can't just think that everybody who listens grew up in the 60s and has followed everything and all the solo music and knows it religiously. There are young people who listen who don't know 80% of the music, Mm -hmm. you know? And you've got to try to reach out to every single one of them. And I think that as much as I could care less about some of the younger activities, you have to bring that out. You know, you have to be able to address address all people. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the guests are concerned, like you said, there are fewer and fewer, certainly of the 60s, fewer people that are left alive exactly. that you can even have as a guest right. and that's just reality mm-hmm. i mean aside from a few of the apple artists james taylor who's has no reason to be at a at a fest for beetle fans, sure. or, right. or mary hopkin who barely ever gives interviews or is out mm-hmm. there there aren't too many people out there thank god that we had peter and gordon right before gordon yeah. passed away Billy J. Kramer has been a semi-regular. Thank mm-hmm. God we got those people. Yeah. There's a few others from from Brian Stable that maybe you can bring over. He did have Jerry Marsden many years ago. Yeah. Uh, yes, you know, yeah. there aren't that many left yeah. from the 60s, and that's just reality. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you're not going to get Paul and Ringo there. You're not going to get the children there. Right. But what you have to do is make adjustments and pull in people from the 70s and the 80s, which Mark has done. Right. He's had almost every member of Wings, mm-hmm. except for uh, Joe English. 
Yeah. Uh, every every surviving member of Wings has been there. Mm-hmm. He's hey, he has the two surviving members of Elephant's Memory there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a few studio musicians that I'd love to see. I mean, I, I'd give anything for Jim Keltner to be a guest. Yeah. I don't think that's likely to happen. Yeah, I don't think you know, he's had one of the greatest guests he could ever have. He's had, which is Klaus Vorman. Mm-hmm. There are too many people who are left, and I and I think. As as you're going into the 80s and the 90s, there might be less and less interest in those people. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'd love to see Hamish Stewart and Robbie McIntosh yeah. <laughs> or any of the people that, that played with Paul. There will come a time probably when the, the band he's had for the last, mm, since 2001, mm-hmm. they might be guests in the future. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Sure. But that's what you have left. Yeah. And yeah. that's Stewart, just the reality of it all. Stewart, you know? did, Stewart did L.A., by the way. And and also Hamish, Hamish and Robbie did uh, they did Chicago about uh, uh, about fifteen years ago. Yeah, okay. I, I, I met I met Hamish and I don't remember uh, Macintosh, but I I did meet Hamish. In yeah. Place. Anyway, you were saying, Ken. But you have to ask the fans what do they want? You know, what do they really want that would be make it such a big draw? I mean, this is reality as far as guests are concerned. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you're there to see young people perform Beatles music, you've got that right. every single year. Mm-hmm. I could care less about the puppet show. That's just me. <laughs> but yeah. but I'm sure that they they have its own audience. That puppet right. show Very has its much own so. those kind of things. But you try to appeal to everybody, and the mere fact that this has been pulled off for over 40 years is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. I mean. I, I know there are so many people that are not the least bit aware of all the work that gets put into a radio show like the one that I do. And I'm not saying that to boast. Do you have any idea what it takes to put together a fest yeah. every single year or two of them mm-hmm. or like or three, last year? Three, three like three. last year. Yeah. Do you know what it takes to have all the guests lined up, yeah. to have all these different activities, to, to schedule all these panels, to you know, and to even expand it more to have different activities? Mm-hmm. It's a ton of work that people aren't even aware of mm-hmm. what it takes. Very true. Oh, yeah. So as I... As I've gotten older, I've, I've come to realize, and I relate that to my own work, because people don't know what it takes to put together yes. a radio show. My own family doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I can appreciate more and more, and the fact that, that Mark has been doing this for 40-plus years, more now than ever. Mm-hmm. And all I have to do is witness what I see in the main ballroom with all these guests mm-hmm. and see them jamming every single year. Yep. And that alone is worth it for me. Mm-hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. when you get these, like I said before, these these rare combinations that can only happen at the fest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Where else are you going to see Mark Hudson and Mark Rivera and Lawrence Juber and, and, you know, Gary Wright all on the same stage? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe maybe they're in Ringo's All Stars or some of them are. You're never going to get all these people in some other venue performing together. You know, it's like I'd love to see Jeff Slate's Birds of Paradox go on the road. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that easy yeah. because you can't get, you know, Lawrence Juber lives in California and he tours all the time sure. and right. uh, that kind of thing. But to get this this kind of combination is so rare and it can only happen. It's something like this. Yeah. And that's why I appreciate this more and more as years go on. And like I said, you have a Billy J. Kramer there. You have a Peter Asher there. Mm-hmm. Hold on to them for dear life yeah. because they have stories that they can tell. Just like the people from the, the the following decades, treasure these people because they're not going to be with us forever. Mm-hmm. And this is this is the perfect opportunity, aside from seeing them live, yep. when uh, when you can actually do this. So I don't know what fans what there is to complain about. Yeah, right. if you're trying to appeal to every age age group from the first generation fans to the newest fans, there's something there for everybody. You know, and the only complaint that I could possibly make about the fest is that I can never do all the things that I want to do. Yeah, all right. Because I, same here. I could spend I could spend the whole day in the main ballroom and be happy with that, mm-hmm. but then I'm going to be missing other panel discussions. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, I, I also try to get my own private interviews when I'm there. Right. I also enjoy talking to all the people who follow my shows. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you're pulled in so many different directions that you can't do everything that you want to do, even if you're there for all three days. Mm-hmm. Right. And so for anyone that complained about the one in New York last year, come on. Yeah. You couldn't, you, you couldn't fit all those guests in the, in the hotel in New Jersey. Oh, it was just yeah. guests alone. Yeah. It's, it is insane. Oh, it was, you had it was absolutely a- crazy. And, and, and yet, incredibly, there were people complaining. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that the, I mean, uh, the ticket prices were too high. The parking was too much. New York, New York, crazy New York. Oh, it's, it's nauseating. You know, every now and then I like to ask fans, who would they like as a guest that hasn't been there already? Yes. And there's very few people left that you can even think yeah. of. Right. You know, yeah. and even then you have to sometimes uh, stretch it a little bit to maybe – a British invasion artist that may not have had direct contact exactly. or worked like, that closely like the, with like the Beatles. Peter right. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I've spoken to Mark, what about Eric Burden, someone like that? You know, there's, there's mm-hmm. those few people. It, it, it's very difficult yeah. to try to find other, other guests that haven't been there already. And the ones who haven't been there probably don't have an interest no. or um, they're only going to be there if they have something to promote. Right. And right. that's, you know, that's the main thing. Yeah, I mean, a James Taylor, you know, just is, I mean, obviously he's not the, you know, the mega star that he once was, but he's still, you know, his asking price alone would probably be prohibitive because hmm. he still plays large, he still plays large arenas. You know, yeah. he can still sell out Madison Square Garden. So right, he's not right. going to appear at a, at, a, at a fan convention, please. Right. He yeah. has no reason to. Right. There's no purpose behind yeah. it. It doesn't benefit him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't know what the fans want. Well, the, the few that are complaining about these things, it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, you know, I just, as I've gotten older, I've appreciated all the work that gets put into it. Not just what Mark does, but all the other conventions. Yes. It's just, a, it's a ton of work. Mm-hmm. And most people don't even realize that. Yeah. And the fact that it's been pulled off for 40 plus years is extraordinary. And not just, uh, not just in our area, but Chicago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I know he just did the one in LA. Right. But it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. He did one in Boston several years ago. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, it's, it's a ton of work. And, and most people aren't aware of, the, of, of what it takes to put these things together. Oh, yeah. Especially uh, last year, the, the fact that there was, I mean, less, there was, I think, about six or seven weeks between the Chicago Fest and the L.A. Fest. And mm-hmm. it was the, the amount of, of work that had to be, you know, begun, I mean, almost immediately after we got back from Chicago was just monumental. We should uh, clarify what your role is with the Fest because you're, you're – Oh, yeah, nothing. yeah. I mean, yeah, right. In all – in all candor, although I think I think that comes through uh, in what I've been saying, uh, is that I'm I've been involved with, with with the fest either in an official capacity or as a you know friend or whatever since the very first one in 1974, uh, and I've been you know as uh, doing all manner of different of different things. So. Uh, you know, so obviously I'm not totally objective, but I think I'm objective enough, and I've you know had enough experience as a just an just as an observer of the fest, let alone being part of the the operation. Uh, and and it's the same with Ken. Ken has been uh, involved uh, with the fest uh, to, to some extent over the last uh, maybe twenty years. And more than that, yeah, probably more than, more than that. that, probably going back to like, you know, the, like the beginning of the nineties, I guess. Uh, so it's, um, uh, so yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, obviously I'm not, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not a impartial observer, but I think I, you know, I think I've got a pretty good, uh, a pretty good handle on, you know, how things go and, and how they should go. Okay. Know? All right. Uh, and I, Actually, the uh, what I did in LA was the first time that I actually hosted a right. an event, yep. um, the fest. Um, uh, I did. I have been on. I had been on uh, a panel uh, at least once uh, before in the old in the older LA the fest, but that was the yeah. first. Time, yeah, but that was the first time mm-hmm. uh, I had actually hosted an event, and that was fun. I enjoyed. I enjoyed mm-hmm. that. Anyway, I just want to, for everybody, you know, for all that all that we're saying, I think that needs to be said. Yes, that absolutely. We have had that and we what, had full, some full disclosure. Full disclosure. Yes. What were you going to say, Ken? I just wanted to give a shout out to Tom Franjone, who co-hosted yes. uh, the fest for the whole weekend, and that's you know, 
I, I imagine on Monday he was comatose. He was. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I would be, especially since know. he had to be back at work this morning. Uh, yeah. yeah, between the I, um, I, I have a feeling he probably had an afternoon yesterday, much like I did. Oh. I think Tom uh, probably uh, got a lot of sleep. At least I hope he did uh, yesterday because he was going absolutely full blast, uh, mm. especially on well Saturday, both Saturday and Sunday. Because he because he had to bounce between you know uh, co-hosting in the ballroom when either Ken Dashout was not there or when uh, when Darren or Ken or whoever wasn't available and uh, and there and the and doing trivia and name that tune and various and sundry other things in the discussion room. And he did a presentation on the BBC recordings in the, in the fabratory on Saturday, on Saturday afternoon, just a a half hour uh, on Saturday afternoon. And, and plus all manner of other things. So, uh, so he was, he did a yeoman's job, and and frankly, the uh, thanks largely to Tom. The um, uh, let's see how I can put how delicately I can put this. The previous <laughs> co-host was not missed, and has been not missed in the last three conventions. The one who so gracelessly left the camp. Let's put it that way. Okay. Okay. Without right. mention, and also right. without mention also names. We should- we should also give some credit to Darren DeVivo, yes. who helped us out on a few of the panels. He was, was great working with me on the on the two panels mm-hmm. there. And also a very happy 50th birthday to Darren. Yeah. He, he's the baby of our group, actually. So uh, yes. in yes, fact, he turned the big 5-0. In fact, he posted, uh, he changed on his Facebook page, he changed the, you know, the scheme at the top of the page to the cover of the early Beatles which was mm. released the day that he was born. Yeah. Uh, actually, oh, okay. I, actually, the day before he was born uh, in 1965, wow. as was an album called Bringing It All Back Home by Bob Dylan, which, you know, mm. let's face it, uh, you know, with all the 1965 stuff I've been doing, and, you know, as I said somewhere today, I said, you know, yeah, there are at least 365 reasons why 50 years later, 1965 is the greatest year in the history of rock and roll. But the release of bringing it all back home is one is a major one. Hmm. Well, pretty soon we'll be doing a show on 1965. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Anyway. All right, gentlemen, I think we've kept everyone, uh, uh, hanging on here long enough. Um, thank you both for talking <laughs> about, uh, the festival of Beatle fans. I'm sorry I wasn't there. It sounded like it was a, uh, it was a blast. It was um, a lot of fun. It was fun. Yeah. It always it is. Mm-hmm. It always is. It always is. Anyway, um, this is Steve Marinucci. We look forward to seeing you next week on Things We Said Today. You can uh, contact us uh, by writing Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail dot com. You can catch us on uh, now on Pure Pop Radio on uh, Tuesday nights. You can catch us on Fab4Radio.com on Saturday and Sundays. We're on iTunes. We're on YouTube. We're on Podbean. So we are, there are uh, there are plenty of places to catch us. Ken, do you want to you want to say anything before you go? Sure. You can al- you can also catch my show Every Little Thing on Fab4Radio.com. It's on. Sunday nights, and it is on 11 o'clock p.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, and that's right before things we said today. So you can hear both those shows back-to-back, and every little thing is also heard on Pure Pop Radio, and it's currently on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, like we said before, give uh, give your support to both those stations, because they're doing an extraordinary job, both of them. And um, please check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. I have weekly Beatles trivia in which you can win great prizes and also uh, some special contests on my website as well. And there's also a lot of great interviews. You know, one other thing I wanted to make mention here is that I interview a lot of the people that we have on this show. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's nice to, to hear both interviews because I get to ask a lot of questions privately that I don't get to do when we do our show together. It's a whole different feel with both interviews. So I just did one with Glenn Burtnick, which is on 
uh, my website as well that you might want to check out. Mm-hmm. And Bob Gruen, who we, Bob Gruen, who we just mentioned earlier, who just uh, put out a brand new book on Yoko called See Here Yoko. It's got photos of Yoko through the decades from her time with John up through today. And that's a really good book. So interviews, trivia, all kinds of stuff on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. I have, yeah, a, lot of, I have okay. a lot of listening to do. <laughs> because I still Thank haven't you. I still haven't listened to the Beatles Mistakes show. Normally I listen to the uh the podcast on mm-hmm. Saturday afternoon while I'm doing various things at home and obviously I was doing other things elsewhere this Saturday afternoon so I still have to listen to the uh uh this week's show. You know what yeah. I I I, ha- I have to confess I listened to it Monday uh, Monday yeah it was Monday at the gym. Mm-hmm. I was, I'm on the treadmill and I'm listening to us talk and it was, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I know obviously what the show's going to say, but it's still fun to hear it. Right. And, you want to hear the finished situation. product. So if you're working out at the gym, bring things we said today with you. <laughs> or if you're scrubbing the bathroom floor. There you go. Anyway. I know a lot um, of people that listen on the train ride to work, you know, it's just. Yeah. It, it's go. really you, know, you can you can just relax. You don't have to care about driving your car at all. You can just listen while you're sitting down. Right. Close and your act- eyes and listen. And actually, if you have your if you have your iPhone hooked up into your car like I do, um, you can hear it while you're driving, and it's it, it's better than listening to some of the local radio stations. Anyway, <laughs> enough plugs about the show. Um, sure. Thanks again for for listening. This is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. 